components are in the drive at the time, and they are low-level formatted by the manufacturer at that time to work only with those boards. So if you swap them, they will actually work on the hard drive, but you won't ever be able to read your data back because they have to be really low-level formatted and go through that whole process again. So if you want to, what you need to do is find a hard drive I can go usually as much as two months out. So whatever day it was made, I either subtract or add two months. And usually I'm pretty safe. I try to get it as close to two weeks as possible so that I can get the most likely drive that's going to match this part. If something goes bad with the drive and you've got to change this out, it's really easy. There are no components on these boards that are actually like soldered to the drive or wired to it in any way. It's four screws. You take four screws off, pop it off, and there's a little contact. So this is going to be one of the items that you're going to have to find to solve most of the problems. So now let's disassemble the hard drive and look at all the internal parts. <clears throat> this component right here, we're going to go through as one solid piece. Even though technically it's made separately, the heads are mounted together in a sequence. They cannot move. And the logic board that goes with it is typically wired directly to this little green string that goes down the arm of the hard drive. So we're going to treat those as one component. In the old days when you would have, anybody have an MFM hard drive? You remember you could low level format those things? And then IDE came along and there was no low level format anymore? The heads somewhat would guess where they needed to go because they used a stepping motor before 1986. And in 1986, Connor released one of the first ones that used something called the voice coil. So the big change between this is that the data that was written to the drive had this server info, the alignment info. So written in a little space that you cannot read with your equipment at all. There is some servo info, which is geographical information about where your data exists in those sectors on the hard drive. So that at all points in time, the head is reading that data, sending it back to the electronics, and telling it where the head is on the platter at all times. You can't read that data at all. And this is one of the reasons why you can't do a low-level format anymore, is because they use a special machine to do the low-level format and write the servo information into it called a servo writer, which is very expensive, and we don't have one. So, Anybody can think of what happens when you have multiple platters in a hard drive if you took out the platters and tried to put them back in? The heads are aligned. They knew that they were going to move as one solid piece, and so all the servo information fits in a pie slice in a cylinder. So if you move that even a micro inch, it is not going to be able to read that data because the geographic information will no longer be there and it will no longer be correct. So that's the other question I get all the time is, well, if my hard drive is dead and these heads are such a pain to replace, why can't I just pop out these platters and move them over to another drive? Well, here's the key on the top of the drive that I showed earlier. There's one screw. Sometimes there's a couple of screws. If there's more than one platter, they spin freely. There is, no, there is nothing in between them except the little locking ring, and once you unscrew it, the two platters will spin independently, and you will never be able to get them to align again at all, period. So the hint here is we're not going to be moving platters from one drive to another if there's more than one. So let's go into the head a little bit. Most of the technology that we use is actually extremely old. Almost everything that we do was invented by IBM, and most of it happened before 1950, 1956. The first hard drive that came out was released by IBM in 1956, and they used a magnetic oxide, an iron oxide. Anybody know the other name for iron oxide? Rust. And it's very soft on their, on their platters. And in 1956, the heads actually touched the platter. They had a lot of wear on those platters. And in order to get five megs, you would have to have 50 24-inch platters in order to get five megs. So you've got heads scratching these platters all day long. So they had to come up with another method to make these things work. Originally, there was a slider at the end on the tip of this head. There still is a slider, but they call it a Pico slider now because its original function was to kind of work like a railroad with two rails on each side and the head reading the data in the middle so that the head could be suspended enough that it could read that data. Today, since it floats, 
we don't have to worry about that, so it needs to be small enough just to mount the information, the pieces on it, so that it will be light enough to float in the air. But they discovered, because of that wear, that they needed to do this, and an engineer figured this out and released a hard drive in 1963 that the heads actually floated, and that's called the fly height. He says it's kind of like vinyl. It's not really like vinyl at all because on a vinyl on a, on a record, uh, right, you, well, you're reading the magnetic information off of it. There's no laser yet. They're actually working on that. Right, one touches, the other one doesn't. So the arm of the hard drive is actually manufactured in such a way that wind resistance is what helps it float. That's why it looks a lot like the wing of an airplane. Everything on that arm is optimized for speed to try to keep that thing floating in the air where all the holes are cut and everything. And that includes the triangle piece down here that was cut that way so that it would have strong rigidity but still be light and able to be lifted off. But we're going to go into how the voice coil works since we've got every hard drive uses a voice coil today. Basically, at the end of this area here, the voice coil uses resistance like the speaker does. When you supply energy to the voice coil, it causes it to move back and forth in very small areas. So that's why they needed the servo information so that they could try to track where the head was because with a stepping motor it would move in certain increments, but with a voice coil it doesn't move in those increments at all, so they supply small amounts of energy so that it can move in small increments and then find out where the head is so it can go and read the data. <clears throat> now, today, almost all of the platters are made with aluminum or glass. Now, there's some advantages to using glass. One of the things with glass is that it's smoother than aluminum. It doesn't expand as much when it's heated and they can do a number of different things with it to make it spin faster because the same amount of glass that would weigh the same amount as aluminum is more rigid so they can make the platters thinner. If they can make them thinner, they weigh less and they can spin faster. So over the years, it has increased the speed of the ability for us to read data from this hard drive. The airflow that causes the head to float in the air, um, that is one of the big things that may possibly change shortly. The head of the hard drive right now flies at two one millionth of an inch off of the top of that platter. And just to give you some idea, hair, your thin hair is two thousandths the size of that. It is twice, it is two thousand times the size of where this is over the platter. Now, Seagate just came out with some different ideas about trying to move the head of this platter closer so that they can read more information off of it to affect density so we can get more data off of it. This is where this comes into play. Right now, currently, all of the hard drives that we use, with the exception of two or three that have come out in the last year, and one of those is that 750 gig Seagate hard drive, does not use this particular method of recording, but for 50 years we've used longitudinal recording where there is a north and south pole and the data that's written to the hard drive is written in one direction and the other direction is basically ignored. So anytime that the head picks up traffic going over that, it will detect that as one bit and it will read